former minister and founder of Something or Other Publishing, Wade Franson, is the host of Created in the Image of God, a series that examines the role of religion in society, from messianic returns to the emotive responses transmitted through our culture. Wade fearlessly addresses reality claims from all directions, objectively exploring their compatibility with Holy Scripture. Joining him is Daniel Sanderson, CEO of Planksif, an international philosophy and cultural media outlet, helping emerging thought leaders with personal branding by co-creating organic content. Tonight's episode, The Year of Jubilee, was Moses an economist? Welcome to Created in the Image of God. My name is Daniel Sanderson, and tonight's topic includes a very good friend of mine, a very good, dear friend of mine, Professor Steve Keen. Um, we're hoping that he will make it into the studio tonight. Unfortunately, he hasn't made it yet. Uh, he's staying in London, and it's actually two in the morning for him. Uh, the good news is, is that we had a lot of clips and a pre-recorded uh, footage between myself, Wade, and Steve. Mostly Wade and Steve, but it was uh, it was a riveting conversation, and we're going to share bits and pieces of that conversation with you tonight. Now, tonight's topic is the mosaic economic system included in laws and regulations designed to promote social justice and ec economic equality. This is what we're going to be talking about tonight. How far ahead of its time was it? And if applied today, would the mosaic economic system create a just and equitable society? Now, I want to share something with you guys. Steve Keen is, in my opinion, the world's greatest living economist, and that's quite the claim to make. Um, no other economist, in my opinion, has integrated the complexity, systems thinking, and rigorous mathematical logic into the discipline of economics in an earth-shattering way. As frequent listeners to this show and anyone familiar with my philosophical leanings, the earthward bent towards the diversity that sustains each and every one of us on this planet is only distracted by the devices that we carry. This ignorance that we defend and the hostility is what binds our species, a rather different and poetic introduction into tonight's guest. Let me bring on Wade France into the studio. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dan. It was indeed a wonderful conversation that you set up with uh, Steve Keen and we are still hoping that he will have stopped hitting the snooze button here shortly and join us in the studio. He did confirm that he would be here, um, but as Dan said, sometimes it's difficult getting up in the middle of the night. What I'd like to do to start this, and we had a plan B in case this situation would arise, is share a clip from a three and a half hour interview with Lex Friedman. And this was a very, uh, very popular show, despite the length, uh, 1.6 million views. And he opens up with a simple question. It's very short, but powerful. Um, check this out. Hang on. Yeah, I just got to maximize this. There we go. Uh, and that's not what it's been at all. Let's start with a big question. What is economics? Or maybe what is or should be the goal of economics? Well, it should be to understand how human civilization comes about and how it can be maintained. What is economics? What is the goal of economics? It should be to understand how human civilization comes about and how it can be maintained. What a wonderful, beautiful statement. And you can see why we chose the topic, was Moses an, eco an economist? As most of us know, the Judeo-Christian ethic is the foundation of Western civilization. Of course, we also have Greek thought, and there's debate among scholars as to whether or not Hellenic thought was at all influenced by uh, 
those events recorded in the Bible. For those who tune into this show regularly, perhaps many of you are of the opinion that, in fact, the Bible is a intentional recording of human history going way back into prehistoric times that was intended to inform the development of civilizations such that, yes, indeed, the Greeks were influenced, whether we have a direct record of the source of where some of their ideas came from and how they modified and adapted and adopted those original principles. But if we look at the story of Moses, who took a slave people, led them out of a land of oppression and slavery, and brought them to a promised land. And it wasn't just that the land had promise, but rather that the revelation that came from God through Moses infused that land with promise. And that would include the economic system, which as Steve Keen just so succinctly put, would have given rise to a great civilization. For those who know the story, Jacob, whose name was then changed to Israel, who was the father of the 12 tribes who became enslaved in Egypt and who were later liberated and then populated the promised land. Those 12 tribes of Israel were given the mandate to become a shining city on a hill. Yes, I do use that term because it is biblical, but it also evokes the vision for America, for this collection of 50 states in which I reside. Also intended to be a beacon of hope in this modern day. But going back to that beacon of hope in that time, the statements that were made to the people of Israel by God were that he wanted the leaders of other nations to admi so admire what Israel was accomplishing that they would come and seek counsel and ask, what is the cause of the greatness of this nation? And that they would answer, the greatness of this nation depends on the laws that were given by the divine creator. In other words, we have here the revealed approach to civilization, and we're following it. So Steve Keen, who said economics should give rise to civilizations and maintain it, uh, we really wanted to have a direct discussion with him about Moses, and this discussion has been teed up. We'll play some clips here shortly. But the point that I'm making is this. The Mosaic law established a pattern of economic acti activity that would give rise not only to a great civilization, but a sustainable one. Let me quickly outline the principles of that Mosaic law as they are to be found in the book of Leviticus. And I'm doing this from memory, so please forgive me to the degree that I get something wrong. First of all, we had the Sabbath day, a day of rest. So these people who had been slaves, who had been forced to work seven days a week, and had who had at the end been forced to make brick without straw, in other words, they had this quotient of bricks and the Egyptians provided the straw. But when they started asking for the right to go out and worship their God in the desert, Pharaoh famously said they will make bricks without straw. It was the let them eat cake statement of the day. They shall make bricks without straw. And so now they had to gather the straw. Their women and children had to gather the straw so that the men could make the same quota of bricks. Now they come into the promised land. The first thing that they were given was a rest day, a day of rest. On the seventh day, you are forbidden to do any work. Now, you would think that you wouldn't have to be forbidden to do work if you had just been a slave, right? Well, look at our workaholic society today. But more importantly, no one could enslave you and force you to work. It was absolutely strictly forbidden at pain of death. Once every seven days, you were forbidden to work. You must rest and you must commune with God. You must, as the crash test dummies said in their song, God shuffled his feet. It was a day for picnics and wine and bread. And then the, then the creator sat down and intermingled and communed with the people. So that was the first principle, but the land was also supposed to be given its Sabbath. Every seven years, the land was supposed to rest. See a weave of a principle here. 
And part of the reason is the first commandment in the Bible was dress and keep the garden. And that came before be fruitful and multiply. The be fruitful and multiply part, as Steve Keen would probably point out, is one of the tenets of economic theory, right? That you have growth, that you have an increase in GDP. And as the people multiply, the products increase, they become scarcer, values rise, land becomes scarce. You know, it drives economic, this, this multiplication, this exponential growth drives all kinds of things. So you have this balancing factor. The people must rest a day. The land must be allowed to rest every seven years. And within that seven year cycle, economic activity was also tied to that so that every seven years debts were forgiven. Debts were forgiven. You couldn't be in grinding, impoverishing debt. A debtor could only lend you money for seven years. And if there were only two years left in the cycle, the, the lender knew he had to get the money back within two years or he would never get it back because the debt would be forgiven. So you have this natural limiting factor on the growth of economic activity. The third and very important point is the Jubilee year, which we'll get into here in a moment. And we'll play a clip from Steve Keen in which, in which I brought this up with him. Every seven cycles, so seven times seven, the 49th year, Israel was to declare the year of Jubilee. Now, the year of Jubilee was a was the, the famous debt forgiveness. And so because of that, people overlook the debt forgiveness that happened every seven years. So it was different in the year of Jubilee. Well, now we have to explain another factor, which is that the land was to be owned in perpetuity by the people. The entire nation, the entire promised land was divided up and given as an inheritance to the families. As they came into the promised land, the various tribes were selecting the part of the country in which they would reside, right? And the tribe of Manasseh famously took half of its inheritance on one side of the Jordan River and half of it on the other side. They had their cake and they ate it too. Um, the other tribes, Ephraim, Naphtali, um, Judah, uh, Levi, by the way, did not have an inheritance. They were the priestly class. They were dependent on the tithes, the taxes, if you will, from the other people. They had no inheritance. Uh, but the others had an inheritance. And so in the year of Jubilee, if they had sold their land, if they had leased their land, you might say, for the remainder of the Jubilee period, let's say it was 10 years until the Jubilee and somebody got into hard times or for whatever reason decided to let somebody else use their land, the land reverted to its rightful inheritors every 50 years. All the land reverted back to the families that owned that land in perpetuity. So if, you're, if, you're, um, if you were a, the son of a man who had lived in a terrible manner and failed to maintain his land, failed to till his land. Maybe he became an alcoholic if there was such a thing back then. I think there was a lot less of that because people had to work to survive. They didn't have leisure time. And so they were forced to, to work or die, right? But if somebody somehow lost their land, then the son might be impoverished, but his children had hope. Because if your grandfather screwed up and your dad suffered his whole life, you would re-inherit that land and get a fresh start every 50 years. All, so, so this has so many implications and it's so far ahead of its time. Whatever period you date the writing of that story to, however late in history you think it was written, or however early you think it was that this oral tradition was maintained accurate, accurately and then later written down. This economic system is a recorded version that predates modern economic theory, you know, by a millennium or more. So now let's listen to a clip um, where Steve Keen and I get into this a little bit. 
and the destruction of the large part of the natural environment. And I never want those beliefs to be dominant again. So the right. question, how do you stop that? You know? And therefore, a set of beliefs which exalt life and say humans should be there to maintain the and, and, and enhance the conditions for the survival of life. That's the religion we need. And like in that sense, if, if the Baha'i and Buddhists are closer to it than Christianity and, and Muslim religions, but well, you know, we, we, we need yeah. something on the other side of an apocalypse. Well, that's why they, I, I want civilization constrained. I mean, my if you know E.O. Uh, e. Wilson, the uh, yeah. recently deceased evolutionary <laughs> biologist, a major principle he argued for was what he called half Earth, and that is that half the Earth should be reserved for non-humans. And I would actually go beyond that. I'd rather see like a 75% of the planet being written as off limits for humans. The other 25%, sure, capitalism and definitely humans, but but 75% of it we've got to keep for the rest of life. And it's our objective in, in the very long term uh, is to enable life to extend off Earth. Amen. And that and that we we need we need beliefs. We never lose that principle. And the trouble is that I know I know what humans are like in in the sense of forgetting. And if you send, think about that one thing that a belief and a religion does it provides a long-term memory right uh, and you and like yeah. codify things like you know, maintain the garden uh thou shalt not well, kill blah 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 they're maintaining me, beliefs but don't do what we made the mistakes of previously but let you, me, how do you hang me, on to that without getting them corrupted so the last verse is in the old testament remember the law of moses my servant right you just said remember so the last uh -huh. words are remember the law, including this law of Jubilee, this whole economic system that was supposed uh -huh. to be established, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what are those four horsemen of the apocalypse? They're promising war, famine, pestilence, all the things that science has adopted the role today of apocalyptic prophet prophesying those exact same things that are coming based on climate change for example uh -huh. behold i will send you elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the lord and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers lest i come and strike the earth with a curse those are the last wow. words wrapping up this whole epic sequence that starts with dress and keep the garden and be fruitful and multiply. And then in, in the mix, wow. and here's an economic system which you should learn, which would provide you a sustainable way to manage your affairs as you grow as a species. That's my perspective wow. on what that whole story is about, regardless of, of what the Jewish religion and the Christian religion have done with those texts. Wow. Okay. I think we have some reasonable common ground there. So, so let's, uh, let's have a longer conversation.
So it looks like we're having some technical difficulties that the interview with Steve Keen was not being seen. Of course, Dan and I are enjoying listening to him, but it sounds like from the uh, chat in the in the chat uh, column that Steve's interview wasn't heard. Well, Steve and I were going back and forth on the topic of the Mosaic system, the year of Jubilee. And Steve was uh, mentioning that he was actually living right now in the uh in the apartment in london of uh, michael hudson who is a, an, a renowned expert on the year of jubilee so i do apologize steve was um validating the insightfulness of that and the and some of the benefits of that um we hope to have steve on here live so that he can go into more detail on that. But I'd like to just cover a couple of points. And Dan, feel free to jump in here if you, um, if you have uh, comments to make. What, but what I want to highlight, Steve and I were going back and forth on the first and second commandment, the first one being dress and keep the garden, the second one being be fruitful and multiply, and the interplay of this and how the Mosaic law regulated the natural tendencies. What I personally find fascinating is Steve was highlighting, and, and, I'll, and I'll throw this over to you, Dan, in a minute here, because I'd like to get your take on this. Steve was per personally highlighting the aspect of how the U year of Jubilee, to quote now um, Norm Chomsky, speaks truth to power, right? Steve was referencing how that would be the um, rulership cycle, right? At the end of every say, let's say 50 years, you have a new ruler, Steve said at one point in the interview. Well, I don't know how true that is really. But my point is, Steve saw it in the light of restricting and regulating the power of the rulers versus a religion that would inspire the people, right? So I find this dynamic very interesting in terms of what is the purpose and the intent of that regulation. What is it attempting to achieve, right? On the one hand, regulation binds the hands of certain powerful people and uh, puts out laws, commands that can throw them in jail. But the purpose of religion is to inspire the people to rise to the occasion of structuring a civilization uh, worthy of their of, of the noble possibilities we have as humans versus one that is governed and ruled by our baser instincts and baser selfish nature. Mm. Um, Dan, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I just had an idea and I know that's probably my problem, <laughs> my platonic problem, but um, have you heard something in biology that our cells get completely re um, 
substantiated or I don't know what the word would be for no, it. It's, but... a, it's absolutely true. I, I, I had an autoimmune disease and I had to study into that for my own health's sake. And I actually put yeah. together a 14 year plan to regenerate and make cleaner, healthier copies of my cells for my entire body mm. over 14 years. And I think it's almost every cell in your body regenerates. It dies and it's replaced by newer cells, except for mm -hmm. your brain cells, apparently. Mm -hmm. And isn't it, isn't it something like seven years? Like, isn't that ironic? <laughs> I thought it was seven years and I thought, oh, I just made that correlation. Um, that well, it, it, it varies from cell to cell. I think that's a little bit oversimplified. Different kinds yeah. of cells regenerate much more quickly. Some of them but only the last point, yeah, days, some of them the, last, yeah. I know, but the, the point yeah. of it is, is that we're talking about a comparison of some sort of derived wisdom from ancient text. Mm -hmm. And on these cycles of seven years, and 49 years, well, we can tell, you know, part of that has to do with the cycle of the sun, right? So it's hedonistic in a, in, in a particular sense. I'd say. Wow, little jab there, right? But no, so it's, so you've got this, you know, you've got this cycle of every seven years. And then you think, well, they didn't even know I have a germ theory. So, you know, they're deriving something from some sort of observation, however abstract, but they're trying to derive wisdom from this regenerative sort of process. Now, one of the things in a political imagining is the body politic, right? You're trying to, as a species that is known for its ability to imagine, well, you move into this inhabited space of body politic. We wanna have a politic, we wanna have a polis that resembles what a bigger form of a an entity is right like our 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 political body should resemble what the individual body is at the aggregate right and so this is this imagining imaging of goodness right and you know i mean it's just spelled well, different and for, for, for students of the bible they know that the apostle paul used that analogy quite a bit in terms of describing the body um you know the anyway but I'm just throwing that out there for our religious friends. So yes, yes, absolutely. It's a it's a common theme um, that society, you know, with its different parts and whatnot, yeah, mm -hmm. could aspire mm -hmm. to be that. So, but but what point are you driving at with that? Well, it's just the derived wisdom that we didn't even have a germ theory, and yet there is this renewal on a on a property sense, on a power sense, on an individual identity sense we can go back to the wisdom that we derive from the ship of theseus and what you know what when when the planks are all removed and there's not a single original piece in that ship <laughs> how can we call it the ship of theseus interesting but, right yeah. and so well yeah so perhaps off on a different tangent um at other parts in the interview steve predicted basically the collapse of human civilization as a result of our inability to structure society in a sustainable manner, right? He's a, he's a, he's a climate alarmist. I would, I would say, would you agree? Um, yeah, but, but I want to say that with a lot of love. I've, I've sure, said sure. that before. I, yeah. I'm but let's, let's explain that alarmist piece because even, and I would say a month or two after Lex Friedman had that interview, he had um, a couple people talking about the climate debate and he, even even Steve's per, even uh, Lex Friedman's perspective was don't go far all the way over to one side from an alarmist perspective don't go all the way over to the ignore perspective right like try and find some sort of middle ground and I was like hmm yeah that's right unless you're wrong <laughs> well but I was I was actually going to talk about a different kind of middle ground so let's just establish that he's a climate alarmist and I don't mean that positively or negatively he simply believes that we are in a trajectory with ecological collapse collapse civilization disaster because of our economic systems that are not attuned to sustainability to dressing and keeping the garden however you want to word it. My point is there's an intersection here with, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse for religious people. But Steve talks about in that interview, 
it seemed, and, and I want to get into deeper conversation with him, in which he seems to believe that after that collapse, we will perhaps survive and be smarter and wiser. And perhaps then, perhaps then we will get it together. So the question might be, do we think that we will come back from the precipice? Do we think whether you believe it's climate change, whether you believe it's nuclear weapons, whether you believe it's just the collapse of the societal order and some kind of zombie apocalypse, as we look out at our now 8 billion people and our highly, highly advanced technology-based civilization, what happens when an alien releases some kind of electromagnetic thing and destroys all technology on earth and we have <laughs> chaos and collapse right will will we build back better not to use a political slogan here in the united states will we learn our lessons as a species will we will we rediscover the mosaic economic system or some other variation of it that allows us to balance the dressing of the garden dressing and keeping of the garden with that being fruitful and multiplying. I don't know how to, how to address the alien. And the, <laughs> My point is it know, doesn't like, matter how the collapse will come. Oh, oh, it doesn't matter how it collapses. It okay. doesn't, um, so that's why I say yeah, he's yeah, a yeah, climate yeah. alarmist, but I don't want to talk about <laughs> climate. I don't want to suddenly go down the climate rat hole, whether it's true or not true. That's not the point of this discussion, whether it's going to be the climate that gets okay. us. Or some, mm -hmm. or some pandemic, right? What were the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? It could be any one of those four, right? Pestilence and disease or famine, right? And yeah, elsewhere but, in the book of Re Revelation, it talks about the sun becoming seven times hotter and men crying out in pain from the heat of the sun, right? Whatever it is that's going to cause the collapse, will we learn from it? Will we be different? Are we on a trajectory to change? Uh, you're, you're, you're stunning my ability to respond because I want to respond on the climate thing, at least at least to say it's the discipline that he's his whole life. Well, not, this is where his whole life trajectory has come to. Right. And so I don't want to negate the the work that he's done on climate and try. But and I don't want to talk about climate change, especially with him not here. <laughs> Okay, can we not talk about climate change? I want to talk about whatever. However, okay, so so let me so let me frame it because I you know I don't I want I'm trying to you know guide me to where we can have have some wisdom we can extract some wisdom from this. So regardless our, of how our a civilization our unsustainable <clears throat> civilization practices, okay, whether it leads to climate disastrous climate change, or whether it leads to nuclear war. Or whether it leads to, you know, that diseases become rampant destroyed by a pandemic, or any, or or that's why I brought in aliens or aliens from mm -hmm. outer space <laughs> that give us the great yeah, reset. Will we have learned something? Mm -hmm. That's the question. I, Are we on? I, the I, path I don't know. To learning something. I know those aliens will be black swans. That's all I know. <laughs> 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 right. I, mean, right. I, I don't know. I don't let's know. Let's go what to we a, do let's that. let's go to a commercial break because um obviously I'm driving at something that is not meant not not meant to be answered. So, in in sorry folks, we really wish Steve were here. It would be much more entertaining than listening to me and Dan. But I'm gonna now sh play um a clip or a, an advertisement for a new show that Dan is launching in conjunction with something or other publishing. Uh, watch this, and we'll be right back. Your story has the power to start a movement. Journalism is more than a tool for broadcasting news. It's an important way of fostering meaningful cultural relationships that create tangible change in our society. With our anthology Cultural Journalism, you can now do your part and make your mark. From expert writers to passionate amateur, everyone has a story to tell. Our aim is to promote equality, empathy, and create a safe space for different perspectives and interpretations of the world around us. Come join us today and break free from the toxic news cycle. By submitting your story to cultural journalism at info at superllc.com. 
So tell us a little bit about cultural journalism and what 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 can we expect? When can we expect it? Oh, it was flip flopping. That is a great. I really love the production team, especially at Soup that put that together. Um, the idea was an anthology, and I think unless people don't know about anthologies that are produced uh, through uh, and with Soup Publishing, uh, it's it's quite an interesting process um and that's really what that little video started to tease at my project's a little bit different um i'm going to embark on starting next week a new youtube series probably quite shorter than these hour long hour to two or two one hour to two hour long long form discussions i'm probably going to do something a little bit more condensed about various different topics once a week on culture and the journaling aspect of of culture right there's there's a certain understanding of cultural journalism which is uh, reporting on the things that matter most uh to our groups and to our culture and to our civilization so that's what it's going to be about thank you dan and when yeah. when do we expect <laughs> to see that uh the first one i think is on june 4th i believe my daughter's birthday I shouldn't say that. Strike that from the record. When you, when, when you yeah. go back to produce this show and you have Steve's video actually playing versus whatever the audience was experiencing, strike that I made that comment. Um, let's yeah. now quickly play uh, the second little short clip from uh, the Lex Friedman interview because apparently that one people are seeing. Here we go. Stuff to ask here, which is, so Marx's vision for the s socialist utopia is you have to go through capitalism. Mm. The Mensheviks were true to Marx's original idea. Right. So is there a case to be made that in the long arc of human history on like human civilization on earth, that we're going to live out Marx's vision for a utopia, which is like, will we run into a wall with capitalism? I think we are running into a wall with capitalism. In fact, I think we've already gone through the wall and we haven't yet realized we've smashed our skulls. So the reason oh. I wanted to share that clip in which um, Lex teases out part of Marx's theory, which was that originally the um, <clears throat> Marxist revolution was supposed to start in Great Britain, where, where capitalism would have run its course and then the evolution would be communism, right? Um, coming out of that, well, that didn't happen. Um, but Steve Keen, and I don't know his particular, I don't know enough about him to know his particular thoughts on this, but that we are now closer to that point that Marx was predicting would happen with Great Britain, in which we've, we've smashed our head into the wall and there's no way forward, and we have to come up with a different model. and. Um, of course, Marx put forward a model, but it's different. That model is different from the mosaic model. And, and my point is, well, you go back 3000 years and you have a divinely revealed model, whether you accept that or not, doesn't matter. You could take the model on its own merits without worrying about where it came from. It, it's either true or it's not. It either works or it doesn't. Um, rather than the Marxist view in which Steve is here saying, we would have to go through capitalism. Why? Why, Dan? Is that because the this gets back to the previous question that I was trying to hone in on? Will we have learned something? Are we evolving? Are we getting to the point where we're smart enough to, to think systemically and arrive at a higher, deeper understanding of how we are all one and all interconnected and how we as a species must what? become more cooperative like the ants or the bees versus um you know more mm -hmm. uh you know ravaging a lone wolf uh, whatever other analogy you'd want to use well i was listening to you and then i thought well okay um i i could see how you could derive some wisdom out of the psychology of it and i think from your standpoint you're saying hey, it doesn't matter okay you know the 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 people that are not the devout followers of a traditional religion um that's okay if they want to derive the wisdom that came from you know these ancient texts and we can look at it and say 
how is this true and how do we relate it to human psychology? And let's proceed cautiously around the wisdom that we can derive from th th that I'm okay with, right? Um, I think that's the common ground to have the conversation ar around and with. Now with, with Marx, uh, of which I've got a love-hate relationship <laughs> with, I think, you know, it, there's nothing that can, you know, rile me up faster than, than, than somebody with, uh, uh, how do I say this politely and nicely? Um, can you help me, my friend? Like, how would I, how would you say, what, is that an Achilles heel? You've heard me are multiple you times. Are you referring like, to a recent uh, reaction when, uh, you perceived that somebody was, um, evidencing mm -hmm. entitlement of some kind versus hard work? That's a perfect example. That's a perfect example. And if, and I understand their systematic issues. And I understand that systematic change needs to happen, but I think that it's not, I think one of the problems about, with a, a Marxist revolutionary type of thinking is that it's inherently, axiomatically a revolutionary right. aspect to it. Yeah. That, that, you know, the, asking them to rise up right to and rise destroy up. the current system so that a Burn new down birth the can that's right and i so, think that <laughs> is scary as all it's a scary, it's a scary <laughs> I, i'm reminded for some reason i'm reminded when i moved to germany which is you know a european socialist state and part of the reason i moved to germany was my childhood experience living in Sweden was positive before I had any awareness or understanding of a whole bunch of things. As a child, I, I associated Sweden with good things and America with bad things. And so when I came back to America in the middle of sixth grade, I was arguing for socialism with my American fellow sixth graders who would naturally argue for capitalism. And neither of us knew, had a clue what we were talking about or arguing about. But nonetheless, um, it's been a lifelong passion to explore and understand how this could evolve and develop. And we have that same sort of childish sixth grade debate going on in this whole country about the idea of Marxism, right? Creeping Marxism. Now, in, in my opinion, you hit the nail on the head. It is that revolutionary aspect, because as Steve Keen would point out from an economic theory perspective, it's important to understand the economic theory of Marxism. It's, it's important to understand the dynamics of what he was describing and why he was proposing it as a solution to real problems that he saw. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded now, that's backdrop for when I went to Germany and um, I was fresh out of college with my undergrad degree in theology, which a, a German friend who went to the same university said, no, 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 it's not real. You don't really have a degree in theology. What you have is a degree in applied sociology. And I had to admit he was right. We were not really getting into hardcore scholarly studies of theology. We were reading the Bible for its value as, as practical application to transform society. That was the nature of the degree which I got, applied sociology. So it's interesting, I came to Germany, and we had these speech clubs for, you know, training people within the denomination we're at to, to be able to speak in church, to give short sermons, which were called sermonettes, possibly to be trained, to become ministers, and just to be able to articulate yourself about your ideas and your beliefs. These were called, these were like, like the um, spokesman clubs, or they were like the, um, these speech clubs, Toastmaster, Toastmaster, they were patterned after the Toastmaster clubs. So you would practice speaking and debate. And so I joined one of these in Germany within our church. And the topic came up of basically welfare and, you know, the German socialist system. And I quoted the Bible. And the Bible says, if a man will not work, he should not eat. <laughs> you should have seen the member and i and i thought i was making this statement to a friendly crowd mm -hmm. right fellow believers who would nod 
their agreement with this professed wisdom from the Bible. If a man will not work, neither should he eat. Of course, a basic principle of society. And 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 a couple of people erupted, as, as you pointed out, you may have a tendency to do on certain topics, because that's not how German society was structured. And they began to lecture me on economics and how there wasn't enough work, and they would certainly be working if there were jobs and blah, 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 blah. And how dare you, you know, force someone to starve to death when the society has a problem in which it's not delivering meaningful work to people. Mm -hmm stopped me in my tracks and made me think because there were some interesting counterpoints or counter arguments. But then you have this very blunt, bold hammer of a statement, if a man will not work, neither should he eat. So that's perhaps an interesting little point to discuss in terms of if we applied the Mosaic laws, would they work? Or would they engender the collapse of society? How would we introduce a forced land Sabbath? How would we introduce a forced cancellation of debt every seven years? Is this something we could ease into? Or is this something that by fiat and mandate could instantly be well, forced in his throat? Yeah, what no, I mean, when I when you were telling me about that, I actually thought um, it, it would be kind of interesting. Um, let's just role play for a minute. You're the landowner and I'm the person living in the cabin trying to do whatever. And you, you know, and we're, we're negotiating something related to work or some sort of like market exchange. Right. And uh, and you say, oh, that's really interesting. But the because the seven year cycle is coming up, I'm not willing to get into any kind of long term uh, arrangement like we will game the system. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. There's a realistic sort of change in negotiation that's actually happening between me and you, okay? And I was actually kind of intrigued by that kind of negotiation and relationship. So fi family dynamics, tribal dynamics, groups would kind of ebb and flow in different particular ways, but they would do it in cycles that would not be so multi-generational and unrigid, right? Uh, or too rigid, right? And so I was actually kind of fascinated by that. I was like, oh, that that's kind of interesting. Um, so, and then your, your second question is to say, well, like how would we implement that type of thing? And I think in conversations with um, groups like Davos and the angry climate <laughs> changers, right? Okay, and I'm gonna say, right? Yep. But I, I shake my head at them too, because there's this idea that, well, the wealthy 1% of whatever and blah, 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 and we have to, and, and so I'm like, okay, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Are you implying we strip the wealth from them? And they're like, yeah, they've got too much. And I'm going, oh shit, see, see how that goes. <laughs> Like, see how that goes. And, and are you going to start stop at one individual or just the corporations? Well, why not stop at the nations? Let's just strip America of all its wealth because they're the greedy let, pig. Let the, let the mob loose. And where does it stop? French Revolution to... off with their heads. And that's the problem that scares me. And yeah. that's the point of human, how humans interact that I'm thinking how do we logically have a conversation about the 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 dangers of that right so let's go let's go to a commercial break because i want to don't don't forget those points you've raised some great ones but there are also a couple of comments and i want to circle back on one topic but i think we've got the perfect ad to play next to tee up this discussion this is from a gentleman uh, who was an executive in a major corporation. Um, he is uh, an African-American, uh, comes from a minority community, which has many systemic problems, whatever the causes may be of those problems. And his book is actually on financial literacy for entrepreneurs. Um, check out this uh, advertisement. Please consider you know, getting a copy of it to support our sponsors. And we'll be right back with more. If you want to launch your venture and pursue your ambitions, but are unsure how to begin, then Tom Hampton's Chasing Dreams is the perfect book for you. Through his 50 years of expertise in the business world, 
Tom has perfected the skill of breaking down complex topics into easy to follow steps that anyone can comprehend. This book can equip you with the critical financial knowledge needed to gain control of your future and start paving the way for your success. Dedicated to the women who inspired his entrepreneurial journey, this book is a relatable and accessible read for all dreamers, regardless of their professional background. Order your copy now on Amazon or by emailing orders.supllc.com. And I might add that this uh, book has become a number one rated hot new release across multiple categories. And um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful little book with um, including some spreadsheets, talking about balance sheets, helping people understand basic economic principles needed if you, if you want to get control of your finances in your life. It's not selling you anything. It's not uh, you know, advocating some scheme. It's, it's an attempt to educate. Um, so thanks to Tom for writing it. Thanks to Soup for publishing it. And I hope uh, some of you will um, get out your phones and uh, have a look at that QR code and maybe code and maybe order the book. So let's um, quickly now. Uh, hang on, I just got to get rid of the QR code. There we go. Let's quickly go to the chat. I want to I want to um, highlight a couple of questions here or comments. So first one is. I think Marx was saying that those doing the work should get to eat. And I love this comment because I'm reminded of people who, you know, have a problem with the Ten Commandments because they're negative. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And, you know, there's a psychology around that. And it's, you know, perhaps better to say thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, right? Um, to me, this is the flip side of the coin of that scripture. You know, if you're not going to work, you shouldn't eat. And, and this uh, person is saying, you know, laughingly, I think Marx is trying to say that those doing the work should get to eat. Absolutely. Just economic systems should deliver for everybody. And those who would advocate for capitalism versus Marxism, by the way, I'm not advocating for either system. I'm not advocating for capitalism. I'm not even advocating against some of the principles of Marxist theory, but like you, Dan, I would advocate against the revolutionary aspect of it and um, that we should be studying and educating ourselves in order to um, apply some of the principles. Here's a different take on it. So the old, the infirm, infants, mothers in labor, they shall not eat. No. Can't you read? Sorry to be rude. It says <laughs> the man, the man that will not work shall not eat, right? Oh, that man. No, yeah. But in I, other words, <laughs> able. the idea is abled-bodied men. No, nobody is saying, no one would remotely propose that the old, the infirm, the instant, the mother's labor shall not eat, nor was that ever, ever, ever a part of Jewish society that had the application of that law. So I'm taking this comment to task because it's that kind of adversarial ridiculing approach, right? That to me doesn't seem to try to comprehend the point that's actually being made, but rather would just like to throw the point under the bus, bus with some, you know, snappy comeback, right? Um, of course not. This is not remotely what was being proposed by that commandment. Rather, the commandment was, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a more appropriate comment would be, yeah, he should be forced to work so that he could pay his child support, right? Because if he's not working, he's not contributing to society. He should be forced to contribute. Why? To take care of the old, to take care of the infirm. So no, the point of the commandment is to support the cause that you are here claiming to advocate, which is for the infirm, the infants, and the mothers in labor, right? Um, Dan, you're, you're, um, maybe uncomfortable by, by my response. No, to that. no, Sorry, no. I'm, I mean, not, I'm to... not trying to ridicule you, Oz. I'm just saying, um, you know, Hey, come on. 
No, I mean, but you do have some good ridiculing skills, though. Wait, you know, I mean, naturally, <laughs> you can just naturally. You did a good job. It's in my nature. Yeah, right? yeah, I have to try to rein it in. Yeah, I have you, to try to rein it in. So here, so and I, I, you know what? I think so. The wisdom in it is going to is, is going to come out like this. We know if we can contribute as men or women. And I'm not saying I'm going to go down the sexist route and say only men. I'm saying humans know whether they can go out and and provide work and bring it back to the tribe, right? And I mean, for... Well, and back in that day, guess what? Men were the breadwinners and women were... Um, women were... Well, we're trying to derive value for the future, right? So we're trying to right. say, is right. there something transcendental? Is there something that yeah. is universal about that wisdom? And then you have to look at it and you have to say to yourself, well look inside yourself. I, I, Can you provide something of worth? Yep. I, I wanted to, I wanted to tell Oz here that I agree with this one. Yes, you are right. Um, when this happens, when this happens, then you do have those holly, hollow, hungry ghosts. You are absolutely correct on this one. So I think we have a lot of agreement uh, here. Um, it's just a matter of how do you get there? Right. Hollow hungry ghosts. What's he is that some reference that I haven't heard? That's kind of poetic. Yeah, it is. Oh, okay, there we go. See? Yeah, you redeemed yourself. You're very nice there, Wade. What else do we got? Uh, What's well, the, I gotta, the main I gotta problem? Make a with, comment. With, I, yes, that's I, the one I, I was looking at. I have to make at. a comment here. <laughs> well, so, look. A student of history would not anachronistically judge those societies in this manner. I'm not remotely here trying to demean or ridicule. But if you if you studied the history of the times and the reasons for that, you would find that no, it was not a domination approach as to what led to those Abrahamic religions being the way they were, right? So we could have this discussion, um, but no, the, I would completely disagree that, quote, the main problem with the Abrahamic religions is that they are strictly patriarchal. No, absolutely not. That's absolutely not true. And I'd love to discuss that further, but it's important to understand the nature of the society for which that religion was delivered again, assuming that it was delivered, or you could say, if you, if you believe differently, the reason that religion was conceived and proposed by the people is because it did address the societal problems that they saw and they had at the time. And it was a very enlightened approach. It regulated the most base uh, aspects of our animal nature. The Abrahamic religions moved society forward. They did not hold it back. And if you were if you were to study history from with an open minded approach, you might come to that conclusion, or you might remain with the same conclusion. But no, I would just simply disagree with that comment. Hmm. Hmm. Wait, are you? contextualizing it a little bit and saying, I mean, I know you're not, but it, it sounded a little bit like, well, it was a religion that was made for the particular time that solved the issues at that particular time. And I'm oh, thinking... I'm, abso I'm absolutely saying that. I'm saying that we, as a species, <laughs> are in fact evolving, right? We, right? we have problems today that we didn't have back then. We had problems back then, which we have solved today. But that's maybe where if you're giving, you know, if you're supporting his best argument, you're saying that was an old patriarchal system. We need to move into a, a different. No, I'm saying it wasn't. I'm simply saying it wasn't a problem back then. It was but he's feature. saying it is now. No, it, it's not even a problem today. The problem is human beings, how human beings go about practicing it. Right? Oh, I see. Right. So let me give an example. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite examples. It's the curse on Eve or the curse on the snake, the curse on the serpent, the curse on Adam and the curse on Eve. Right. It's actually not a curse. 
It's a prediction, in my opinion. When God says to the serpent, this is what's going to happen. And then he says to Eve, this is what's going to happen. And then he says to Adam, this is what's going to happen. He is providing a, a um, thank you very much for that comment. I really am trying to have a dialogue here and I apologize for my snarky nature. Um, the, 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 the narrator, if you will, God, but the narrator is predicting that because of this, here's how this plays out. And in fact, it did, as the story continues, you see Cain killing Abel, right? Hmm. And you see, you see Cain violating both commandments. He did not dress and keep the garden the way Abel did. And as out of jealousy, he then killed his brother, which is not be fruitful and multiply, it's subtract. It's not multiplication, it's subtraction. There's one less human being to worry about mm -hmm. because I just killed my brother, mm -hmm. right? So the, the, the narrator of these stories, you know, if you were a literary critic, the power of the narrative of these stories, the, the weave, you know, these these far exceed the capability of the best writers of multi-season Netflix dramas with all their complexity, right? <laughs> the weave of the words, the weave of the word sin and how it manifests itself multiple times in the serpent, in Adam, in Eve, in Cain, and Abel. And then even the term devour, symbolic of the animals. These words are very carefully chosen in that, that narrative of the initial opening chapters. And it's simply predicting that because of the way that these two human beings are now mm. relating, there's going to be hell to pay. <laughs> mm because of their behavior, because of their choices. It's not God from on high punishing them at all. That's not what's going on. It's a, it's a loving father saying, look, I've, I've advised you to do this, but if you do that, it's, you, you know, you're not going to be happy. <laughs> you know, I'm giving you the car keys, but I'm telling you in your first year, you know, don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this, because it will end badly. And look at the statistics of teenage drivers, right? And what they're, I'm dealing with this right now because I have a teenage daughter who's about to get her license. And I'm like, wait, you come will on, not. that's the twice, that's twice. It's her yeah, birthday you, coming you, up you, and you, she's going to be driving and she's going to be like, you, oh, you Dad. will not, you will not <laughs> be having your friends ride in the car with you in the first few months. You will just not, because it's better that you don't. It's better that you don't have those distractions. We're just going to lay down a rule and and forbid it. If and if you do, you know, then you're kind of on your own, right? Just the first six months, no friends in the car. You can drive it back and forth to school, but you're not going to drive your friends around. We're oh, just yeah. laying down that law. Why? Because we're overly cautious, right? And um, so, what does she say about get, that? Is she okay with that? Well, she <laughs> she um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I don't know the degree to which I've actually concretely defined what the rule will be. We've had sort of general discussions. Oh, about you're it. just throwing out that the law is coming. But right. But, <laughs> but lo, yeah, exactly. But lo and behold, I'm predicting, right? If you eat of that tree. But um I'm predicting what they already said. I sat there and did some of the driver's ed with her, and they're saying this, they're showing the statistics of peer pressure that when I know when it, teens I know. have yeah. other teens in the cars, that is when accidents happen. Yeah, and their Period, brain, end of they, don't, story. they don't have brains. It's until, data. Yeah. It's science. Yeah, right? they, they don't have brains like until they're 25. I understand that. But you know what? Could we make a shorter version of the Bible that just went like, ah, just like one eyebrow that raised up? That's it. That's all you have to worry about. Just like, ah, just give the evil eye. I think that would be good. That's the only commandment we need to follow. Just be cautious and careful. Yeah, we're complex. There are a lot of different situations and circumstances. And and we also, you know, we have that free will. We have that freedom of choice. And it will not be taken from us. I hope to get but, Dan Barker on the show. He's agreed yeah. to, he's uh, he's written a bunch of books with, one co-authored with uh, um, evolutionary biologist. Um Richard Dawkins. Man, how do you forget that name? <laughs> Dan Barker. Yeah. So I'm hoping to have an interview with him and, and ask him if he'd like to participate. 
although he heads an organization that's called the Freedom From Religion. So that would be an interesting perspective right. to take and bring onto the show. So, um, yeah. How do you feel about that? Freeing people <laughs> from religion. I, well, you said that. I'm going to go about... to a commercial. I'm going to go to a commercial break. No, I thought you were baiting me there. So um, <laughs> let's... Uh... <laughs> Because I thought you you definitely know the answer. Oh, just barely, um, barely. <laughs> yeah. So, um, look, I have um, we have guests coming in tonight, which I got to run maybe to the airport. Okay. So uh, I'm going to take another look at the chat. I'm going to skip the uh, last two um, commercials for tonight. Um, let's um, let's bring it back to economics and 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 let you comment on this one, Dan. Okay, you read much faster than me. So you're using a trope of Marx in my in my point. Uh, plenty of data and capital. Is my point, yeah. Oh, is is my point? Plenty of data and capital. But I think that's what he's talking about with a K. Uh, showing how workers were getting a raw deal. You should read the books. Yeah, you know, um, Christopher, I love that. You know, um, if it's almost like a defensive move. If we object to anything that Marx says it's uh, automatically go read the books. <laughs> Thank fuck, you. Fuck. Don't I've read the you. books. I've read don't, the books don't and I'm stand. still critique about it. No, I right. just, I'm, I've, I've had it. It's like the only objection is to say you don't understand it. Well, okay. No, I, I, I admire this <laughs> comment because we're, we're not trying to prevent a one dimensional caricature of Mark. We are not trying to create a straw man only to knock it down. We're not. Yeah, that's that's a better answer. Yes. Um, so workers were getting a raw deal, right? Human beings have always gotten a raw deal. Again, going back to the Garden of Eden, guess what? We oppress each other. Cain slew Abel, right? Two wrongs don't make a right. The fact that there's evil out there doesn't mean that Marx is Marx's theory solves any of it, right? Look, and and mm -hmm. and now I'm going to be humorous. My my cousin in Sweden used to tell this joke. I've shared it before because Sweden, remember, sits just north of the old Soviet Union. And I was actually in. You know, I could respond, Christopher. Have did you ever travel around in the Soviet Union? Because I did. Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Russia itself, Saint Petersburg. When Gorbachev was abducted, I was there, my friend. Right. So I saw how those theories played out. My cousin in Sweden used to say, you know, those boats, those submarines that are patrolling the Baltic, they are protecting the workers paradise from all the Scandinavians who would otherwise, you know, bombard the border. They'd have a border crisis in Poland up, up on the Baltic if it weren't for those submarines protecting Russia's border to preserve the sanctity of the worker's paradise because everybody, everybody from the West wants to move there, right? It, you know, they didn't work. They didn't work. Why didn't they work? Well, of course, there are all kinds of reasons why they didn't work. Why did you have the Khmer Rouge, right? Mm. Why did you have the Red Guard, Christopher? You know, there's plenty of data showing how Workers in socialist countries get a no, don't get a raw deal. They get murdered by the millions, right? Can we blame that on Marx? I'm not saying we can, but we're not trying to work with caricatures here. And if, if we want to, you know, go back and forth with caricatures, we can. That doesn't solve anything. And, and that's I, not. I, yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I mean, the, the you know, Marx was a brilliant scholar and a genius. And in his time, he's and he's left humanity and economics he's a he's a he's a forefather to economics however um i think that he tried to describe sociology in an in a in a total description of sociology based off of his labor theory of value which is insufficient and incomplete it's not a complete description so how however well intended to describe the totality of it he only got to three books and he wanted to do six he actually didn't publish the second and the third book so i would have loved to see what he came out with in four five and six so i have read the books and i would have loved to read the other books as, as a matter of fact i had the daydream the other day to try and come up with the five 
the four, five, and six. How would we imagine it? Maybe that's a project you'd like to participate in, Christopher. Welcome that. Let's do it. Let's write it. We got a lot more information than we did in Marx's time. Totally different society. Well, I want to. I want to thank. Um... I want to thank everybody here for their comments. We had robust discussion in the chat, even while we were trying to show the Steve Keen interview and it wasn't working. Um, any particular comment, Dan, that you want to award a free book to? It's tough today because there's so many great ones. Which book are we awarding? I don't know. <laughs> well, the one that did exceedingly well, uh, the one on uh, teaching uh, young leaders how to, to uh, rise up and be strong business entrepreneurs. Yeah, right? I don't think that's that is a that is a like a um, chasing dreams. You mean no? It's um, I don't think that's it's it's not, a book not, that not provides a... basic financial literacy. It talks about balance sheets, explains, you know, how to, you know, create a profit and loss statement. It's for it's for people who want to start their own small business. Oh, well then maybe that's perfect for Oswhistle then because you know he's <laughs> he's in love with my... <laughs> It's it's not. Okay, just <laughs> now I'm digging deep. Come on, Oz, Oz. let's go. It's, let's it's go. Not Come on. <laughs> um um, why don't we do this? You know, they can come and tell us what kind of book they'd want. So this is a, you know, you tell us, you know, what kind of book you'd want. So pick, pick the comment and we'll let them pick oh, the book. Okay. So I pick the comment. Oh, geez. Okay. And I have to stay from away from Oz because he's too tempting. Okay. Let's, um, <laughs> Oz, it wasn't me that denied you the book. Um, okay. Well, we've already, you know what? I think we got to give one to Phil Dobby. Yeah, whoever he is, and whether or not oh, he's the, able to the great review. the great Phil Dobby, we got to get him on this show. Phil, Phil, actually, tell us, are you going to come on the show? Will you come on? He's got the silky radio voice, and he does a weekly show with Steve Keen. I'd love to have Steve. I'd love to have. I'd love to have him on the show. All right. Now it's not a condition. We'll give him a book. He just has to tell us what book he wants. Yeah. And there's an open invitation to come on the show. Phil, will right, you come well, on the show? He can he can connect with you to let you know and we can share a catalog and he can pick. And for all of our audience, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Dan, any words of wisdom on this um somewhat uh, derailed show tonight, which was hopefully uh, useful and entertaining to our audience. Yeah, forget revolution. It's going to be just forget it. Just forget it. Should we quote? Should we quote Lenin? You say you want a revolution. Well, you know, I don't. We'd all love to see the plan. <laughs> you yeah. ask me for a constitution. <laughs> well, you know, we're all doing what we can. But if you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out? Yeah, you can count me out. Don't you know it's going to be all right? That's Lenin. Yeah. Wise words. Um, or as, you know, quoted by Don McLean, while Lenin read a book on Marx, the quartet practiced in the park and we sang dirges in the dark the day the music died. Mm -hmm. With those wise words, let's end it. Thank you so much, um, Phil Dobby. Get in touch with Dan. We'll get you a book. Everyone uh, be back next week where we will have our third and for now, final appearance, um, although we'll probably have him back, of Cameron Cowan. And the topic will be enlightenment and capitalism. The concept around this world uh, be, this doesn't make sense. Uh, something about capitalism and the philosophy of the enlightenment and the interposition with the Protestant Confucian work ethic. Cameron mm. will cover the background of it all. And then we can talk about the issues around how our modern economy came to be. So we seem to be on the, uh, on the subject of the economy, um, not economy, but the ec economic theory and how it drives human behavior. And are we heading towards a more just and equitable society? Are the economic theories that we've been developing helping us? Um, and, um, what, if any, role does religion play? We hope we'll see you all back here next week. And until then, um, may you all uh, have a wonderful...